thank you very much, and uh, I want to begin by thanking the Institute for inviting me to speak today. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here uh, tonight and to, uh, to share uh, this meeting with you. Uh, what I want to do today is look at uh, the question of crisis, conflict, and the political economy of the Middle East. Um, I'm going to talk about three, three things. The first thing is I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the political economy uh, of the Middle East as it uh, emerged through the 1980s, 1990s, uh, and uh, uh, until today, uh, <coughs> looking or presenting a critique of market-based development models, um, what I will call neoliberalism. So a critique of neoliberal development models uh, in the Middle East. The second thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, how we can understand the region of the Middle East as a region. So I want to try to look at what are the patterns of accumulation, uh, what are the patterns of power uh, within the Middle East region as a whole, focusing particularly on uh, the Gulf states, the Gulf Arab uh, states, um, or the Gulf Cooperation Council. So I'm going to look at the role that the Gulf Cooperation Council plays within, within the region. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about uh, what this regional approach to the political economy of the Middle East means for how we, un how we understand crisis, moments of crisis, moments of conflict, uh, such as we have uh, today in, in, in the Middle East. So to begin with, looking at uh, the neoliberal uh, experience. Now, clearly any discussion of the Middle East political economy needs to begin with the reality of foreign intervention, ongoing foreign intervention um, that has been uh, present in the region for, for many decades. Um, uh, we can go back to the time of European colonialism and the partition of, of the region uh, by the French and the British in particular uh, uh, through the early 20th century. Um, all the way through, of course, to the, um, uh, the more recent attacks, uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and so forth. But I don't want to spend too much time looking at the political and the military uh, uh, sides of this uh, foreign intervention, just to acknowledge that uh, this intervention has had disastrous social consequences uh, with which we are all very familiar. But... I want to argue that foreign intervention needs to be seen as much more than just military. It's more than drones, it's more than bombings, uh, it's more than airstrikes, uh, it's more than arms sales, uh, it's more than support uh, for Israel. Um, we also need to understand the economic side of foreign intervention in the Middle East. Uh, and I think too often we leave this economic side unexamined uh, or we treat it as neutral. We look at uh, the kinds of economic policies that have been promoted in the region uh, as being separate from what happens to the political uh, and the military uh, uh, intervention. Now, of course, there were a, a, a large range of or a difference in the pace and the scale uh, at which economic uh, uh, changes took place in the, in the Middle East, but virtually all Arab states moved since the 1980s to implement a set of policies that are very similar to the set of policies that we see elsewhere across um, the world, uh, what we can call neoliberal uh, uh, policies, i.e. things such as cutbacks to social spending, uh, privatization, uh, deregulation, in particular labor market uh, uh, deregulation, uh, liberalization of trade and finance, opening up to uh, foreign investment flows, uh, and so forth. These policies, as I mentioned, uh, really began to unfold in the 1980s, uh, and they were very much driven and applauded by Western states, uh, uh, in particular the United States and uh, the European Union. Uh, these these uh, economic changes that began in the 1980s and continue until today uh, were driven by Western states in alliance with institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, um, and it meant that uh, uh, states uh, moved to implement these changes 
in a very authoritarian manner. In a very authoritarian manner. So the authoritarianism that we saw emerging in the Middle East through the 1980s, in particular in places such as Mubarak's Egypt uh, and Ben Ali in Tunisia. Uh, were very much part of how the economic changes took place. Authoritarianism was part of how neoliberalism unfolded within, uh, within the Middle East. So this meant that Western states supported both the economic changes as well as the authoritarian measures, authoritarian governments that came to power um, at that time. So, for example, Mubarak's Egypt... Uh, was seen very much as the poster child or the role model of neoliberal transformation in the Middle East. And in fact, uh, uh, Egypt received a prize from the World Bank in 2008 to, as, as the world's best reformer, the world's best economic reformer in the, in the whole of the world uh, in 2008 uh, under Mubarak. So we can see, uh, and from 2006 to 2008, Egypt was held up as being the best economic model in the Middle East uh, by the World Bank. So we can see very much that authoritarian states that we had in places like Egypt um, were being applauded by Western states and institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. Now, the logic driving these policies, these changes, were very much a focus on the promotion of private sector uh, growth. In other words to push people more and more onto the market uh, uh, and a reliance uh, uh, on the market and eroding forms of collective and social um, support. The private sector was held up as being the engine, and I'm quoting here, the engine of strong and sustained growth um, uh, uh, for the region. This is a, a quote from the World Bank. And the, the, the key to alleviating poverty. Okay, so the, the private sector was seen as the key to poverty uh, alleviation. Now, what were the outcomes of these, this type of economic model? Now, as I said, this, there was a, a lot of variation across the region, but all states, uh, including states like Syria and, and Libya later on, uh, moved in this, in this direction. Um, but as I said, Egypt, Morocco... Uh, Tunisia and Jordan were really the, 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 the core states, the model states um, for the Middle East. So what, was the, um, what were the outcomes uh, of, these, of these policies? Uh, what, I'm, what I'm about to say is true for prior to the global economic crisis in 2008-2009. So uh, I'm not talking about today. The statistics are much worse today. Uh, but I'm talking about statistics that are prior to 2008-2009. Um, uh, and at that moment, uh, the Arab world ranked near the bottom for many of uh, the bottom of the world in numerous uh, development indicators. So, for example, average unemployment rates uh, for Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Syria and Tunisia were higher than any other region in the world. Okay, remember this is prior to 2008, prior to the global crisis. Um, after the global crisis, things got worse, but um, let's take it at, um, at this moment here. So average unemployment rates for those countries, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Syria and Tunisia, were higher than other regions um, in the world. And very importantly, labour force participation rates, in other words, the, uh, the, uh, the percentage of the, of the population who participate or are part of the workforce looking for work um, or, see, or, or, in, or in employment uh, was also the lowest um, in the world. In fact, half of the population of those countries, um, only half were, uh, or less than half of the population, were uh, in the labour force, considered as part of the labour force. So we can see at, at the level of employment um, quite disastrous um, social indicators. For the Arab world as a whole, youth and female participation rates were the bottom of the world, okay, the bottom of the globe um, of, of any, of any um, other region in the world. And those who did have uh, employment uh, tended to be found in precarious uh, uh, and informal, low-paid jobs. Um, the countries of North Africa had, and I'm sure uh, 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 Conrad Bogat, when he speaks, will speak about this, had uh, the fastest 
uh, growing informal sectors of any place on the planet. This was partly a consequence of labour market deregulation. Okay, getting rid of formal employment um, and pushing people into the informal um, sector. Now, there are many other statistics that I could give um, around poverty, malnutrition, illiteracy, and other measures um, of social conditions. Importantly, though, these are trends that have remained basically unchanged for two decades. So it's not something that just took place recently. It's something that has been uh, uh, constant for the last uh, uh, 20 to 25 years, this kind of, um, this, this kind of uh, uh, very poor development indicators. Now, very importantly though, not everyone lost from these types of policies. Indeed, for several key countries, uh, Egypt, for example, uh, is, is a good example here, growing poverty levels took or, or occurred in tandem or alongside growth, economic growth, okay, increasing levels of economic growth. So we have two trends happening at the same time. On one hand, we have <coughs> increasing levels of poverty, but on the other hand, we have growing GDP, um, GDP per capita increasing, okay, um, through, particularly through the 2000s. So what this demonstrates, <coughs> excuse me, what this demonstrates is that wealth was flowing uh, away from some and towards others. Okay, we have growing inequality, in other words, um, particularly through the 2000s. So, for example, uh, Lebanon, Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia and Jordan, real GDP per capita in those uh, five countries, Lebanon, Morocco, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan, real GDP per capita rose between 147 to 23%, varying for each of those countries, from 2003 to 2008. Okay, so we have growing GDP per capita in those countries, but at the same time, uh, 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 worsening uh, levels of poverty, worsening levels of, of unemployment, um, and so forth. Stock markets also boomed in this period. Remember, I'm talking here prior to the global crisis. Stock markets boomed. So in Egypt, um, the average size of a company listed uh, on the Egyptian stock market increased by more than 1,100%, 1,100% from 2001 to 2007. Okay? Um, similar trends can be seen in Jordan and Morocco. So... These kinds of uh, statistics show us or indicate growing uh, inequality. Um, now, how do we understand this, this inequality? And there's been uh, quite a debate about this within Arab uh, social science uh, uh, and many kind of development agencies working in the Middle East. Uh, there was a recent report uh, that I would encourage you to have a look at by Esqua, uh, which is uh, an, a, a development agency, uh, and they did a report on inequality, essentially, um, looking at kind of development. And they made the comment that, I mean, many of the things that I, I, I just mentioned come from this ESCO report, and they made a comment that Egypt, uh, they called Egypt a paradox, okay, uh, a puzzle, a conundrum. And they said Egypt is a paradox because on one hand we had... Um, between 2000 and 2008, a very rapid rise in poverty, but on the other hand, uh, a very rapid increase in GDP uh, uh, per capita. Okay, so this doesn't fit standard economic models. Okay, the standard economic models say that if GDP per capita increases, then this should alleviate poverty. We should get a reduction um, in poverty. Okay, now. Uh, this, these kinds of standard economic models are uh, still very much present uh, post-2011, post the Arab um, uprisings. Uh, we see them promoted, for example, uh, by the IMF and the World Bank, uh, the Duval Partnership, um, the meeting uh, that took place in 2011 uh, that, that talked about increasing aid um, to the Arab world, particularly Jordan, Morocco, Tunisia and Egypt, uh, very much were, was premised upon these same types of economic um, policies. And both these, the, 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 these kinds of perspectives 
both the S-square conundrum or paradox as well as the policies that we see um, uh, uh, being continued to be pushed argue that, uh, that market-based development policies or market-based development, promotion of the private sector should alleviate um, poverty. Now what I would argue, and, and, and we can talk about this more in discussion, is that this is not a paradox. Okay? This, these kinds of things that we see, this, this growing inequality alongside economic growth, is actually the normal functioning of markets. This is what happens um, generally uh, within neoliberal uh, development strategies. What we see is a polarisation of wealth, not harmonious development for all. And that's what the inequalities in the Arab world uh, reflect uh, this, policy, the, this, this process. We've seen a shift in wealth from poor to rich that has occurred through the neoliberal uh, era. Now, there are two th points that I want to make initially in this regard, and I'll come back um, to this a little bit later. The first thing is that these trends, I think, point to the importance of looking at the re inherent relationship between economic processes and political forms. In other words, we need to see economics and politics not as separate spheres, not as something that happens separately, but actually as very much fused, as very much interconnected. Um, we cannot separate the politics of the region from the economics and vice versa. They are, um, they are uh, together. Uh, and too often, I believe, when we look at the Middle East, uh, we tend to treat these things as separate spheres, as separate, um, as, as separate processes. So, for example, when we look at the political debates in the Middle East today, we see a lot of discussion about uh, introducing democracy, constitutional reform, uh, uh, trying to uh, have you know, uh, better voting rights, better political participation. But at the same time, as uh, social movements... Um, uh, and media and activists and intellectuals call for these types of things, at the same time as saying we want political reform, they, we also see the same types of economic policies uh, being advocated, this kind of liberalisation um, and opening up private sector-driven growth. Okay? So what I, what I would argue is that um, we need to see the political and economic actually as fused and this is why there has historically been such a close association between authoritarianism and neoliberalism. And it also means that if we want to address the political problems in the region, we also have to address the socio-economic problems. In other words, we need to address the questions of inequality um, and the disparities in wealth uh, if we are going to also tackle the political questions of political um, reform. We can't address differences in political power without also addressing socio-economic uh, inequality. So that's the first point, is this, um, the political and the economic as being very much um, interconnected. The second thing, um, the second point I would make in regards to the outcome of these neoliberal policies is that they tell us very, I think they tell us something about what happens at in moments of crisis. They tell us uh, uh, how to understand the impact or the effect of crisis on the region, um, precisely because of this highly uh, polarised outcome, because of this um, growing inequality between poor and rich. Um, it means that moments of crisis, uh, and here I'm speaking about any kind of crisis. I'm not just speaking about economic crisis. I'm talking about conflict, war, refugee crises, ecological crises. These kinds of, at these moments of crisis, they, the effects of these crises tend to be concentrated on the most marginalised and vulnerable and excluded layers. Okay? Uh, this, I think, is a very um, important point because widening levels of inequality uh, have undermined the mechanisms of social support in the region. It has made it more difficult 
uh, for people to rely upon traditional forms of um, collective collectivities or social mechanisms. And so that means when moments of crisis occur, uh, it is the most vulnerable that tend to be hit and the most vulnerable that tend to be um, to, 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 to suffer those crises. So we need to differentiate the effects of crisis. We can't just say crisis is good or bad. Okay? It, 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 the way it unfolds is, is different for different groups of people, um, precisely because of the outcomes of these neoliberal uh, reforms. So to give one example, uh, the 2008-2009 global economic crisis uh, had a profound impact on parts of the population in North Africa, a significant number of people in North Africa, in the North African states. Whereas in the Gulf states, uh, the effects were very different, and I'll come back to this in a, in a second. But we need to differentiate these effects um, of, of moments of crisis. Okay, so that's the, the first part of my um, presentation, is looking at this neoliberalism, the, the, the way neoliberalism has affected the region, its polarization, growing levels of inequality, and the way that it helps us understand moments of crisis. What I want to do now is move to the second part, which is looking at the regional uh, question, looking at the regional scale, and uh, trying, to, trying to map some of the changes um, that have taken place uh, at the level uh, of the region. Now, before I move to the concrete discussion about this, I want to just um, uh, mention that one academic term which I think is useful uh, for how to think about these kinds of questions. And this is um, the concept of methodological nationalism. Uh, I don't know if you've discussed this in any of your, um, in any of your courses, uh, but methodological nationalism uh, is a, a term introduced by two, uh, two sociologists, Andreas Wimmer and Nina Glick uh, Schiller, who say that one of the problems with the way that we tend to look at the world is that we tend to look at it, uh, we tend to privilege the national scale. We tend to look at the world through the lens of national borders. And we treat the national scale as being contained or, or, or self-contained in closed social relations. Okay? Um, and they make a critique of this. They say we need to break with methodological nationalism and instead look at the way that Borders are crossed uh, and cr border, uh, social relations uh, cross uh, borders themselves. Okay? So we can't treat the nation, national scale as something just self-contained without looking at these cross-border, um, how, how the cross-border processes. Social processes cut across national boundaries. So this means the nation-state can't be understood as a self-contained uh, political economy. Now, I think this is very important for how we look at um, the Middle East, um, and I'm going to give you an example of why, why this is the case. Um, uh, I'm going to say that when we're trying to understand what is going on in a place like Egypt or Morocco or Jordan or Lebanon, uh, we can't understand those uh, countries as individual economies without tracking also the changes that have taken place at the regional scale, okay, at, at the region. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this by looking at uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. Um, these are the six states making up the GCC, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, uh, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, these six states um, formed the GCC in 1981. Uh, it's a, it's a, 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 an integration project similar in some respects to the European Union, um, although not as far advanced as the Euro European Union, um, uh, but there are interesting parallels that we could discuss later if you like. Um, so the GCC, of course, um, is characterized by uh, its access to oil and gas wealth, as well as uh, the fact that the social structures are monarchies. These are, these are uh, monarchies, all of, all of the Gulf states. Now, by focusing on the Gulf, I'm not trying to say that the Gulf is the only important feature of the region. There are a range of other important questions that we could look at um, and should look at, including um, the role of Israel and its relationship to the Arab uh, states, 
the role of the, the United States in the European Union um, and its attempt to form regionally integrated uh, uh, economic networks. Uh, Non-Arab states like Turkey and Iran and their, their role in, in the area, um, as well as inter-regional links between the Arab world and Africa uh, and, and South Asia. These are all necessary, and I, I'm not trying to uh, say that these are not important by just looking at the question of the Gulf, but that's the, I mean, this is uh, the, 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 the focus I want to, to, to highlight today. So there's two feature, features um, of the Gulf's political economy that I want to um, uh, note. The first of these is the question of temporary labour migration. Okay, as many of you probably know, uh, the Gulf is unique, uh, perhaps in the, in, the, in the whole of the world, uh, in the sense that the majority of its labour force is made up of temporary migrant labourers. In other words, made up of people who are non-citizens. The, the, uh, in each of those six GCC states, the majority of the, the workforce uh, are non-citizens. Uh, there is no other uh, region of the world that has such a proportion of migrant workers um, with no ability to gain citizenship as, um, the, as the Gulf. Okay? This is very important. Uh, the Gulf also is the, the region um, where the largest uh, flows of labour migration occur um, to the, in the south, in developing countries, uh, globally. Now, these migrant workers uh, in the Gulf as a whole, 70% of the population of the GCC is made up of non-citizens or non-nationals, 70%. It's a remarkable uh, uh, figure. Uh, nearly 90% of these non-nationals work in the private sector, okay? um, which is very important. They, the public sector tends to be the place where citizens of the GCC work, whereas the private sector is where uh, uh, the migrant workers um, uh, uh, tend to work. Now, this fact of the Gulf is important and it, it confirms one of the things I was saying about methodological nationalism because when we consider the working class of the Gulf, if we're trying to say who, who makes the working class of the Gulf, um, it's not enough just to say, look, we have to look in the, within the borders of Saudi Arabia or within the borders of the UAE or within the borders of Kuwait. The potential labour force within the GCC actually spreads across millions of people uh, in neighbouring regions, in India, in, ba in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in the Philippines, in the Arab world, the rest of the Arab world. These, uh, these are the potential, if you like, labour force um, of the GCC states. So we see a continual cycling in and out of workers from these states into the GCC. Um, uh, this is very important. Um, it means that when we think of class, when we think of the working class, we need to see not just who lives within the border, who has citizenship, uh, we need to think of who also exists outside of the border and who does not have citizenship. This is important uh, not just for the Gulf, partly or precisely because of the refugee crises that we see um, occurring throughout the region at the moment. Okay. Lebanon, for example, the population of Lebanon has increased by one-third since the Syrian crisis. Okay. It's, again, a remarkable, um, a remarkable figure. Now, these, this temporary migrant workforce in the Gulf um, is very important to understanding how the Gulf reproduces itself um, because, as I said, they lack any ability to gain citizenship. It's impossible or virtually impossible uh, for any of these workers to get citizenship. Uh, they are brought or, uh, to the Gulf through um, an agent uh, who essentially controls their ability to stay in the country dependent upon a work visa. So if they lose their work, they, they lose their employment, if they're fired from their work, um, they have to leave the country. Okay? Um, and they have no political or civil rights and certainly no rights associated with citizenship, no labour rights um, either. So this is very important for how Gulf, the Gulf societies reproduce themselves, how power in the Gulf tends to reproduce um, itself. Uh, it means that you have a highly controlled and low paid uh, workforce within the GCC which at any moment uh, could, 
could quite easily be sent home um, if there is a strike or if there is a protest or any kind of political um, uh, uh, organisation. So I want to come back just briefly to the 2008-2009 crisis and I'll, I'll try and illustrate why this is important, why this temporary migrant workforce is important to understanding the regional political economy. So as I said, the 2008-2009 crisis, when that global crisis occurred, uh, countries in North Africa were hit by that crisis. They were hit by uh, fall-off in investment flows. They were hit by uh, a lack of a drop in remittances, um, that, were, that come into those countries, fall in tourism, um, a, lack, a drop in exports. All of these factors meant that um, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco were hard hit by the 2008-2009 crisis. Let's contrast that to what happened in the Gulf. In somewhere like Dubai, for example, uh, we saw uh, the real estate bubble uh, collapse uh, in 2008-2009. But what was the response of the GCC and particularly of Dubai to that, to that moment? They were able to deport their temporary migrant labour workforce. Okay, so uh, hundreds of thousands of workers were essentially put on planes and sent home. So what happened at that moment, 2008-2009, is that the crisis was displaced. It was pushed off the Gulf onto surrounding uh, states such as India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. That's where the crisis was felt. It wasn't felt in the same way within the GCC. Okay? So we can see here that the structure of labour migration, the structure of this, um, the, this social structure enabled the Gulf to displace crisis and also meant that crisis, the way the crisis impacted the region was different. The Gulf was able to basically emerge, I mean it, there was some slight problems, but able to emerge from the crisis, whereas those other states in North Africa were uh, profoundly hit by that, um, by that global crisis. So again, we need to look at that differentiated effect um, of crisis. Now, um, uh, the other side of the Gulf, apart from this temporary migrant workforce, of course, is uh, the access to oil and gas revenues or to petrodollars through the sale of, of oil and gas um, on, on the world market. Um, this is very, very important, obviously, and it has helped historically uh, these states uh, develop important large business conglomerates um, uh, uh, in, in, in the GCC, closely linked to the monarchies and to, um, and to the state. Now, and this brings me to the second feature of uh, the Gulf, and it's regionally, its impl implications regionally. Um, and that is, over the last 15 years or so, we have seen uh, the growing internationalization of Gulf capital. What I mean by this is that Gulf capital, uh, Gulf business conglomerates, as well as state-owned uh, investment funds, have... Uh, internationalized, they've, they've, they've um, expanded their investments outside of the GCC to the Middle East as a whole. Okay? This is very, very, very important and it's part of understanding what is going on in the region at the moment. I'm not trying to say that all of the GCC's investments are going to the Middle East. The majority of the Gulf's investments go to the United States and to Europe. Um, this is still true and it has been true for decades. But a very important uh, amount or an increasingly important amount of GCC investments have gone to the rest of the Arab world. Okay? Now, why is this important? Um, uh, it means that the Gulf is one of the beneficiaries of this process of liberalisation that I described earlier. So if we want to understand what were the impacts of neoliberalism, it wasn't just a widening of gaps within individual nation states. There was also uh, 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 the Gulf itself, GCC capital, was also a beneficiary. So as land was sold off, as banks were sold off, as telecommunications companies were sold off, as industries were sold off, the GCC, GCC capital groups purchased many of these privatised um, uh, uh, assets. 
Okay? So we see um, both an increase, uh, a strengthening of the GCC within the region, as well as um, a growing polarisation within individual nation states. So to give you some um, uh, statistics around this, and I'll, I'll show you some also PowerPoint around this. Um, prior to the 2008 global crisis, the World Bank estimated that more than one-third, okay, this is in 2008, more than one-third of total foreign investments in the Middle East came from the Gulf. Okay, this is remarkable. It's more than North America, it's more than Europe. Okay, this, this, this is a World Bank um, estimate. More than one-third of total foreign investment from those six GCC states. Between 2003 and 2008, Remember, this is that moment where I, I, I talked about growing inequality really um, taking place. Between 2003 and 2008, more than half of all global investments in Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine and Syria came from the Gulf. Okay, that's again a remarkable figure. For those um, uh, five states, key Mediterranean states, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, uh, more than half of the total global investments came um, from the Gulf. Now, this is prior to, 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 the, to the 2008 global crisis, but these statistics have continued post that crisis. So from 2010 to 2012, the GCC was responsible for one-third of all FDI uh, in, uh, of the top 20 FDI countries in Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Palestine, Syria and Tunisia. Okay, so if we take the top 20 countries investing in those countries I just listed globally, uh, more than one third of all of that top 20 investment came from the GCC. Okay, so it's, 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 a, it's um, quite remarkable. Now, um, these uh, foreign direct investment figures do not tell us the full picture. Okay, um, they do not include government-to-government -government loans. So it doesn't include, as we've seen very recently, for example, the loans from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait to Egypt. Okay, these do not show up in these FDI figures necessarily. Okay, these government-to-government -government, um, uh, loans. It doesn't necessarily include the investments uh, in stock markets. Okay, so um, a sovereign wealth fund may be investing in the Egyptian stock market, are not captured in these figures. Okay, so what I'm saying is the figures themselves understate the level of the Gulf's uh, incorporation into um, the wider, wider region. And very importantly, and this is a point that I want to emphasise, uh, it doesn't capture necessarily the way that the GCC is also an important base for uh, diaspora Arab capital. In other words, Palestinian, Lebanese and Iraqi in particular, those three groups who have all um, been displaced through war uh, or, and you know, occupation and so forth over the last um, few decades, parts of those diaspora communities have ended up in the Gulf okay, and themselves have become part of GCC capital. Okay, the richest layers of these, these populations I'm talking about. Uh, and in some very exceptional circumstances, they've even gained uh, Gulf citizenship. So the Hariri family, for example, um, uh, has Saudi citizenship, okay, as is a good example of this diaspora capital that has ended up within the Gulf. So um, in this sense, uh, the, FDI, the foreign direct investment figures I, I just gave you don't capture necessarily the, the full linkages that occur um, across, across the region. So um, I just want to give you uh, or to, to show you some of the consequences of this. This is, um, this is uh, I'm not expecting you to um, look at this too closely. It's, it's very uh, uh, dense. But basically this is Egypt. This is the Egyptian agribusiness uh, sector, Egyptian food sector. Okay? What I've done here on, on, on the left is looked at key parts of the food sector, dairy and juice, poultry, cheese, starch and glucose, pasta, edible oils, fruit and vegetable, flour and bread, um, and also supermarkets and fast foods and hypermarkets. Okay? On this side, uh, what, the, what this lists is the 
the way that golf based firms essentially dominate all of these um, sectors, parts of the agribusiness sector. Okay? So this if you look at poultry, it's about it's more than fifty percent of Egyptian poultry controlled by golf based um, uh, golf based firms, uh, likewise with dairy and juice and so forth. Likewise the supermarkets and so the the whole of the food chain, if you like, from farm to sale in the supermarket, it tends to be dominated by these kind by GCC based firms. Okay, Kuwaiti, Saudi, Emirati, um, and so forth. This is very important. Agribusiness, of course, is very important. Um, but if we, we can look at similarly at um, the banking sector, um, we can look at uh, the real estate sector, we would find similar trends. Okay? So this is one um, one example. Another example, this is in um, uh, the Palestinian case in the West Bank, okay? Um, and this is, you will, you will see here, uh, three, if you like, tiers. Um, the first tier are uh, conglomerates uh, and family-based groups that are based in the Gulf. Okay? Some of these are Palestinian-owned. They're the parts of the diaspora capital I mentioned earlier. Some of them are pure uh, Gulf-owned uh, Companies, okay. Um, so there's a list of uh, about a dozen or so of these conglomerates. Um, we can track then uh, their activities through a set of holding companies, um, and then here on the final tier, this is the local Palestinian economy. Okay, so this is uh, industry. It's banking, it's telecommunications, it's real estate, it's in uh, you know housing, all of the, these kinds of things. Uh, service um, uh, service companies, import companies. Okay, if we look, if we map these companies, um, and you can look at this much more closely mapped in this article here, uh, you will see that these companies are essentially owned by um, these Gulf-based conglomerates. Okay, in in the Palestinian case in the West Bank. Okay, it's very important um, to see how this regional economy then is emerging. Okay, how this regional these shapes um, uh, are emerging. In fact, just to give you one example, um, in, for Palestinian banks, uh, 15 out of the 17 banks that are active in the West Bank are controlled by uh, these kinds of groups in the Tier 1. Okay? 15 out of 17, including the top three uh, banks um, operating in the West Bank, Palestinian um, banks. Okay? Um, if we look, for example, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, uh, the situation in Palestine, but those of you who have travelled there, uh, uh, particularly to uh, places like uh, Ramallah, you will know that there's a lot of real estate development taking place um, within the Palestinian Authority controlled areas in the West Bank. Uh, one clear example of this is uh, Rawabi. It's a big housing development um, just a little bit out of, uh, out of Ramallah. Um, this is a very good example of these kinds of trends. Uh, Rawabi is a, is a, is a, uh, um, a billion dollar city um, and it's being funded by a Qatari uh, uh, investment fund alongside a local Palestinian um, uh, 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 businessman who also happens to be, uh, have a lot of his businesses based in the Gulf region as well. He's Palestinian but he, he fits very well within this tier one description. Okay? So it's a, it's a very, this is the largest um, uh, uh, private sector venture um, ever in, in Palestine. So these kinds of uh, ownership ties, we can also find them in Jordan, in Lebanon, uh, and increasingly we can find them in uh, places in the Maghreb, in Morocco and Tunisia, um, uh, increasingly. Not to the same extent as um, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, but increasingly um, in the last few years we can see this. So um, as I said, this tells us something about neoliberalism. It tells us that neoliberal reform didn't just accentuate inequalities within nations in the, in the Middle East, it also ex accentuated regional power balances, regional hierarchies um, uh, 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 within, within the region. Now, um, these hierarchies are widening. This is a, another, I, I, coming back to the point I made earlier about crises and moments of crises, these hierarchies are now widening 
um, post-2011, particularly um, given uh, the, the kinds of conflict um, and the kinds of refugee crises um, that we see uh, across the area, um, as well as the continuing stagnation of um, the global economy. Okay? For these kinds of reasons, we are actually seeing um, a widening uh, of, of these hierarchies. So to show you a few examples of this, this is um, current account balance. Okay? The blue line are the GCC states. Okay? The red line are Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Syria and Tunisia. Okay? Um, so what I'm trying to show here is how, what's, what's the, 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 if you like, the widening gaps um, between these two groups of countries, the Gulf on one hand and these, um, these five states on the other, uh, sorry, these six states on the, six states on the Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Syria and Tunisia. Okay? We see from 2006 um, through to 2014 that gap um, has widened. Here is another one, net foreign assets. So this is the difference between net foreign assets between the Gulf and oil importers. And again, we can see from 2006 to 2014 um, a widening gap. Okay? So in other words, the amount of foreign assets held by the GCC um, is growing, um, exceeding uh, uh, as the oil importers' um, net foreign assets uh, are dropping. Okay? And one more... This is government debt as a percentage of GDP. And again, you can see, um, this, in this case, the GCC is the blue line and, the, and uh, the red line is those same six states I listed before, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Syria, Tunisia. Um, we see increasing levels of government debt as a percentage of GDP um, and dropping levels of, uh, uh, for the Gulf states. So, in all these, there are many other statistics we could look at here, many other indicators that show widening gaps, a widening regional polarisation um, that has occurred over the last uh, uh, decade, basically, but um, over 2011, um, since 2011 has increased. So um, I also want to uh, point out here that uh, the levels of wealth that we see in the GCC, within the GCC states, um, have grown dramatically despite the, um, the problems in the region and despite the problems in the global economy as a whole. Um, the Financial Times reported in mid-2013 that the levels of wealth held by GCC banks, private companies and the wealthiest individuals reached $3 trillion. Okay? Um, so this is privately held wealth within the GCC. Um, so I'm not talking here about sovereign wealth funds and, and state-owned assets. I'm talking about privately owned wealth, private companies, banks, and the wealthiest individuals and families. Um, uh, from 2010 to 2014, privately held wealth in the GCC increased by 17.5% every single year from 2010 to 2014. So... Here is uh, an illustration of this. This is actually 2009 to 2013. This is privately held wealth in billions of US dollars. Okay, so for those six GCC states. So again, to emphasize, this does not include state-owned wealth. It does not include sovereign wealth funds. Um, it doesn't include the oil wealth held by governments or anything like that. This is private individuals um, uh, in the country, private firms, private individuals. Uh, in 2009, the total wealth was uh, 1.1 billion. Okay, sorry, 1.1 trillion. 1.1 trillion. <coughs> um, by 2013, it was 2.179 uh, trillion. Okay, um, so each year increasing by about 18%. Okay, through this period. Remember, this uh, this is a period of crisis. This is, these are periods of crisis throughout the region. Um, and you can see the breakdown within the GCC as well. Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Oman, uh, and Bahrain. So um, this is, again, uh, an indication of uh, increasing wealth levels on one side of the Middle East where, uh, with uh, crises 
on the other side of the area. By the way, these figures do not um, include things like real estate ownership or artwork or, or, uh, or um, collectible items, um, these kinds of things. It's, it's only what's called um, liquid assets, things that can be readily disposed of quickly. Okay? So the actual figures are much more than this. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to just wrap up now with some final comments about what does this mean, um, this kind of regional picture, what does it mean for how we understand um, uh, the, the regional political economy. Um, and I, I want to, uh, I think, just, just make a few points. One, I think, is that these kinds of um, trends that I've outlined really point to the need to be, critically, to be critical of the kinds of development models, the kinds of market-based development models that we have seen in the Middle East over the last 20 years and that we continue to see advocated for by international institutions in the current moment. Okay? We need to take these models very critically and challenge them. Uh, they're, they're, the outcomes have been disastrous. They, they are very much related to the uprisings we saw in 2011. Um, they, have, uh, uh, they have condemned generations um, of the region to uh, 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 basically no future. Okay? These, these kinds of models need to be... Um, need to be critically tackled. Um, but in order to do that, we need to have a much better understanding of the way that capitalism in the region has formed. Okay? I've given you a few little, um, I think, bits of the picture, but there's much more to it um, uh, if, we, if you look more closely. Um, we, need to look, uh, when I, we need to look at things, for example, as who and what are the capitalist classes? in the Middle East? Where do they come from? What are their business sectors? How did they develop? How did they form? How do they connect with um, the, the, the wider region? Sorry, the globe, uh, global capital. Sorry. We also need to be um, very much uh, attentive to labour, uh, labour uh, and working classes. How, uh, what has happened to working classes over the last um, two decades. Particularly, I mentioned, for example, the informalization or precariousness of work, but there's many other aspects to labor, uh, the way it's developed over the last uh, couple of decades, including, very importantly, the feminization of much of labor um, in, in, in the region. How do political forms and institutions such as the state and military, connect to these kinds of trends. Okay, when we think about capital and capitalist classes, how do we see them connect to the state, to the military, um, and, and these kinds of uh, forces, uh, these kinds of um, institutions? Uh, so I think what I'm, what I'm making a plea for is a return to uh, concrete analysis of class formation and state formation um, in, in the Middle East, um, trying to understand these processes. Um, we need to be, I think, very clear to have a critique, not just of the models, but also of um, the way methodologically people tend to approach the Middle East. We need to, I think, be critical of this kind of methodological nationalism, looking much more at what does this, um, these cross-border flows, um, these, these national breakings of national borders, what does that mean for the way we understand class and state, for example, um, in, in the Arab world? Um, and finally, uh, I think these kinds of patterns tell us something about the way, to come back to the point I began with, um, the way that foreign intervention has unfolded um, over the last, uh, uh, the last decades. Um, the economic side of foreign intervention is no less important than bombs, drone attacks or military strikes. And indeed, as the cases of Palestine, Lebanon and Iraq illustrate, very often war uh, and military intervention uh, move alongside neoliberal reform. In each of those cases, Palestine, Iraq and Lebanon, uh, we saw a deepening of the neoliberal processes as a consequence or as a result of uh, uh, military conflict. Okay? Um, and we can talk more about that in, in, in discussion if you like. Um, but these military aggression is often a catalyst for uh, 
economic uh, liberalization. And uh, my fear, uh, and I think um, many other people in the region look at this as, as, as a, a threat or as a, a real danger, is that one of the consequences of the kinds of conflicts we see now in the Middle East is actually going to be a deepening of these economic models that have proved so disastrous um, over the recent decades. That This is a moment where we need to be attentive not just to the humanitarian and refugee consequences of foreign intervention, but also the economic changes that often move alongside with them. Thank you.